take the word of God, please, and turn with me in the New Testament to the book of 1 Corinthians into the 15th chapter, and we'll begin reading in just a moment with verse 12 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Years ago in my Christian life, before God called me to be a preacher, I came to a rock-ribbed, heartfelt, mile deep in my soul conviction that the Bible is the word of God. Now, not everyone who professes to be a Christian believes that. One of the most shocking things for me early on as a young minister was to meet ministers who didn't believe all the Bible was God's word. But just as I put my confidence in God, I, I placed my confidence in the word of God. That makes a church like this, the Temple Baptist Church, a certain kind of church where we say, believe, practice that the sole authority, the only authority for our faith and practice is the Bible. And we make no apology for that. If I'm in a public meeting of politicians or professional people, I'm not ashamed to say I'm a Baptist preacher and I believe the Bible is the word of God. It makes a difference. It makes the difference in our church. We believe if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I'm sure some of you, maybe many of you, have been challenged about your Christian life and you have been tempted to say, well, there's a certain brand of Christianity, a type of Christianity that takes a little further than other types. I just want to be transformed in the image of Christ. I want Christ formed in me, Christ formed in you. Christ lives in us. The Bible says Christ in us, the hope of glory. So when we approach the Bible and we read the Bible, and listen to the Bible, we're listening to God. I'm a declarer, I'm a prompter, I'm, I'm a giver, I'm a, a sender of the word of God. I'm a preacher. I hold the Bible in my hand and I, I believe because I have God's word that I have the authority of God's word. That doesn't mean I'm infallible, but I believe the Bible is infallible. I may say things from time to time that are questionable, even controversial. But when I'm speaking the Bible clearly, plainly, distinctly, and it's God's word, it's as though we're hearing the word of God. Every letter, every word, all of it. We have a term, we say we believe in the verbally, plenarily inspired word of God. We believe verbally every word came from God and plenarily all of it is from God. Now I'm going to deal with a particular passage in scripture where the Lord uses a different way of speaking and Taken out of context, you could prove some things that aren't true. But the Lord chooses to use this form of teaching in this passage. He talks about the negative, negative consequences of not believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The negative consequences. So you say, well, I believe, wonderful. There ought to be positive consequences to that. But there are people who say they do not believe. I have had hundreds of people through over half a century of ministry look me in the face and as sincerely as you can imagine someone being say to me, I just don't believe that. Well, you have every right to your opinion. But if you don't believe it, there are consequences to your unbelief just as surely as there are consequences to our belief. And the Lord takes a, a passage of scripture here on this most vital subject 
and deals with the negative consequences of unbelief. And I want you to be able to see a Bible, look at the scripture, see exactly how God stated it because we said we believe these to be the words of God, the human penman is the apostle Paul. And you come to the conclusion. You have to find out which side you're on. If you're on the side that says you do not believe, then be prepared for the consequences of your unbelief. Or decide that you're on the side of belief and rejoice in the consequences of your belief. Let's look at it together, please. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 12 and going through the 19th verse. The Bible says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that it, he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this statement. In verse 14, if Christ be not risen. And in this passage, God deals with those negative consequences. If Christ be not risen, if we have no resurrected Christ, if there is no resurrection of Christ, I want you to listen carefully, please. And make careful notes. I want you to be able to repeat this message to someone who says he or she is skeptical about the Lord, about his word, or about the resurrection of Jesus. Take them at their word. If this is what they declare, if they say to you, well, I, I just don't believe those things. They have every right to say that. But if they say they don't believe these things, they need to be ready to face the consequences of their unbelief. Now I want you to hold your place here just a moment and turn with me back to the gospel according to Matthew. In the 12th chapter, I have brought your attention to this one thing in Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse 33. The Bible says, either take the tree, make the tree good Verse 33 of Matthew chapter 12, and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. The tree is known by his fruit. A person, a girl, a boy, a man, a woman, you're known by your fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. So there's consequences to everything we say and do. Verse 37, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, 
we would see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there is no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah's and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. They said, Lord, give us a sign concerning yourself, a sign. And the Lord said, there is no sign except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. Even so, shall so the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's talking about the resurrection. Now, what he is saying plainly is, if you believe the miracle of the resurrection, if you believe the miracle that God raised his son from the dead, if you believe that Jesus actually died and rose from the dead, then you won't have any trouble believing anything else God says or God did. So this is the linchpin. This is, this is the thing that it all hangs on. And so we're living in an evil and adulterous generation, no doubt about that. Every survey tells us that evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. So you're going to hear more and more say, I don't believe that. That may be your faith, but not mine. That may be what you believe, but not me. And so God leads by his spirit, the apostle Paul, to write to these Christians in Corinth and to take that particular aim on this subject. So you say, some of you say, you don't believe in the resurrection. So if you say you don't believe in the resurrection, let's deal with that. Notice again, please, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. If Christ be not risen, that's what you're saying. If Christ be not risen, then write it down. If Christ be not risen, number one, your preaching is vain. Your preaching is vain. What, what sense is there in preaching? The Bible calls this kind of Bible preaching foolishness. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, the Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So no matter what I say, no matter how hard I say it, or no matter how thorough I try to be with it, if I'm taking the word of God and trying to convince you from the word of God that this is true, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if there is no resurrection, then our preaching is vain. Number two in his list. Then is our preaching vain and your faith is vain. Your faith is vain. Now we live by faith. All of us who are Christians live by faith. The object of our faith is the person of Jesus Christ. It's not just faith in things, it's faith in a person. Faith is, is described and faith is defined. Faith is described as a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is really defined in Hebrews chapter 12 as looking unto Jesus. But if you're looking unto Jesus, if that's what faith is, you're trusting in Jesus, whether you're going through some trying circumstance, going through a surgery, praying for a loved one, whatever it may be, wherever faith must be exercised, it's foolish to try to exercise faith because faith is vain. It's just vain. All of life is sight if Christ be not risen. 
then your faith is vain. Number three in this list God gives, notice please, not only is our faith vain, yea, verse 15, and we have found false witnesses. What you're saying is not the truth. The easiest thing in the world to do is to accuse someone of saying, that, that's not true, it's just not true, it's just not true. And lies get large in a hurry, don't they? They don't live long, they don't live long like the truth lives long. But false witnesses, you're a false witness. And the majority of the world says you're a false witness. Why is it? They can't believe in the supernatural. They can't believe in God. They can't believe that God sent his son to bleed and die for our sins. They can't believe that God's son died for your sins, not his own sin, and was buried and rose from the dead. You say, I, I, I'm firmly against that. All right. All right. Then our witness is false, to you at least. We're false witnesses. Notice the fourth thing. He goes on in his list, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. And if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. Now, I told you he's using this negative argument to deal with these consequences. And he brings us to this. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins. That's the fourth thing. If Christ isn't risen from the dead, there's no remedy for sin. When you sin, you're just in a mess. The Bible says to us who are Christians, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I can be clean again. Did you ever want to be clean again? Lord, help me, you know? I always want to please my mother. Now, that sounds a little far-fetched to some people in this generation, but I was the oldest of four children, and I felt a, a, a sense of responsibility to my mother. I wanted Ruby to have at least one perfect child. But I found out I wasn't perfect. And it grieved me so to break my mother's heart. My wife, even to this day, after we've been married over half a century, says, you're more like your mother every day. And I say to her, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I love my mother. My mother, I wish I could describe her to you. She was, a, she was a mighty thing, a little less than five feet tall, a little less than 100 pounds. She was a mighty thing. My wife will say to me sometimes, you have your mother's hands. I say, thank you. I have big hands, far-reaching hands. I hope strong hands. But my wife said, they look like your mother. I, I wanted to please my mother. And when I didn't please her, when I did something wrong, it grieved me. And if Christ be not risen from the dead, I just have to stay dirty and stay dirty and stay dirty. Can you imagine after all that dirt of sin piles up on one and just gets one so far removed from God and you just stay so dirty? Can you imagine that? So dirty. If Christ be not risen, there's, there's no forgiveness for sin. As a matter of fact, God says in his words, you're still in your sins. Oh, my God, help us. You're still in your sins, verse 17. You're yet in sins. Hmm. If Christ be not risen, there's another thing. This fifth thing, I believe. He gives it to us in this list. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they, I, I want you to mark that little pronoun, they. That little plural pronoun, they. They also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. 
If Christ isn't risen from the dead, you'll never see your family or your loved ones again after death. Never. I remember saying to my mother when she was dying, I'll see you again. I'll see you again. And she smiled, big, beautiful brown eyes open, and she smiled. The hardest death and funeral I ever attended in my life was my father's funeral. I was just a boy full of confusion. Didn't have the facts, didn't have the truth to deal with it. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew he was dead. And I had this awful feeling that I would never see him again. Now I found out years after he died that he had made a profession of faith. He tried to tell me about it. But according to what the Bible says, if Christ is not risen, you will never see your loved ones again. Never. May God help us. That's a serious, sobering thing, is it? How many of you love your mother and father? You may have had to forgive them for things and they ha certainly have forgiven you of things. But you want to see your departed brother again, your departed sister, your mother, your grandmother. My wife's mother just went to be the Lord about a year ago. She was like my own mother. As a matter of fact, I say to people and they laugh, but it's true. She loved me more than she loved Evelyn, even though Evelyn was her daughter. As they would say in another kind of church, can I get an amen on that? <laughs> You're saying amen? Good. To think I'd never see her again. I would never see her again. If Christ be not raised from the dead, our loved ones after death are gone forever. Perished. Look, whatever... Else, God says, if Christ be not raised from the dead, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If Christ be not raised from the dead, we are all most miserable. There's no hope. There's nothing out there. Every heaven song must be done away with. It's just foolishness. Every resurrection song must be done away with. It's foolishness. And basically, we see in a world in which we live, people living as if Christ did not rise from the dead. We're surrounded by people who are living as if Christ did not rise from the dead. Does this characterize their lives? Preaching is vain. Faith is vain. Christians are false witnesses. Look at it. Their faith is vain. They're still in their sins. Their families are gone forever. And they're most miserable. We're living in a world of miserable people. Some of you are miserable. You may be lying about it, but your face is telling the truth. And your deeds are telling the truth. Your thinking and outcome is telling the truth. What's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? You're living as if Christ did not rise from the dead. But then you come to this verse of scripture. Verse 20. But. But. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And become the first fruits of them that sleep. He's saying no matter what you're saying. Or how loud you're saying it. What you're saying isn't true. Christ did come to earth and became a man without ceasing to be God. He did bleed and die for our sin. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and he came out of the grave alive forever. 
He spent 40 days with his disciples and he ascended to heaven where he ever lived to make intercession for us. And he said, all who come to him by faith he'll receive. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I've tried him and proven he's true. Hallelujah. And I go back to this list and say, I've been preaching places and seeing God take his word and use it to change lives. I placed my faith in the person of Jesus Christ and found peace and calm in the midst of sometimes what could have been an overwhelming storm. I know this to be true. True. That true witnesses telling the truth from God's word have been used of God to speak to me and I pray that I've been used of God telling the truth to see the others, others' lives changed. And what a mess people get themselves in. I've often said to some people, some not so old, very young, you've made such a mess out of your life with your sin choices. But God can cleanse you and make you whole and make the slate clean because Christ paid your sin debt. And he did. And I've walked to a grave sometimes with my own loved ones and many, many times, scores, more than I could count, with others I've loved and longed to see again. And I know I shall meet again. I shall meet again. I've seen the rich and the famous, a few of them. I saw the President of the United States say, to me personally, I'll see my brother again. Saying in that statement, I know my brother was a believer in Jesus Christ and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Not perfect, he was saying, but I believe I'll see him again. Why? Because Christ lives. Christ lives. And I'm not miserable. I may appear sometimes to be broken down, bones going every way but the right way. You know, a composite of nuts and bolts and screws, I hope, placed in the proper place from one part of my body to another, cut open in the back and the front. And uh, one time my spine surgeon said, I know you better than anybody knows you. I've looked at every internal part. But he put me back together, and I'm not miserable. I'm happy. I'm so happy. God has given me a joy that no one else could give me, and a peace that passes understanding. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. And I'd hate to be numbered with that miserable crowd out there that's going to hell and parting it up like the rapper who said, I'd rather go to hell and party than go to heaven and be bored. Hmm. He just doesn't know. He's of that crowd that some say there's no resurrection. How many of you are of the crowd that say there's a resurrection and you rejoice in it? Now some people poke fun of you because you're a little extreme because you're a Christian, sold out, Bible-believing, Christian, who believes in God who sent his son to be your savior. Don't flinch. You're on the right trail. And someday when the going gets really tough, you'll go right on through with Jesus and he'll bring you safely home because he lives. He's risen from the dead. He's risen from the dead and he lives. Which side are you on? Whichever side you're on, you're going to have consequences. Let's bow in prayer together, may we?